avoiding or fixing software rot in Windows 10. Hi everyone, I'm Leo Notenboom, where I've been, well, avoiding and fixing software rot since well before 2003 when all this started. Before we start, if you're watching this on YouTube, go hit that subscribe button so you'll get notified when there are new videos available on my channel. I cover lots of tips and tricks and issues like software rot. If you end up liking this video, hit the like button. Hitting the like and the subscribe buttons actually helps more people find their answers when they're searching on YouTube. So software rot. First of all, what the heck is it? It's an interesting concept. It's not as prevalent as it used to be, but it definitely still exists. The bottom line is this. Over time, as you use your computer, it becomes less stable. That's software rot. The software seems to rot. It seems to get worse over time. Now, to be clear, I say it seems to. The fact is, if we weren't touching it, if we weren't doing things with and to the software, it would not change. It would stay as stable today as it was on the day you started using it. But the fact is, lots of things contribute to software slowly becoming a little less stable over time. I want to talk about a few of those. Some of them you can avoid and some of them, well, they really require a different kind of solution. The number one cause of software rot today, installing and uninstalling software. If you're one of those folks that likes to try things out by installing it and then uninstalling it, chances are each of those uninstalls is leaving a little bit behind or it's changed the state of your system some way that it actually didn't reset when it uninstalled. Those things in and of themselves are usually very small, very minor and very benign, but they can add up. They can add up to a slow degradation of your system's performance. There's another thing that happens too, and that is an accumulation of what I'll call files or libraries or runtimes. We see this a lot with respect to things like the Visual C++ redistributables or what used to be now the .NET library that you would find in your list of installed programs. Shared libraries of code are one way that multiple programs prevent having to reinvent the same wheel that everybody else is using. Rather than writing their own wheel, I'll call it, they'll simply include one that everybody else uses. That means when program A comes along, it installs library Y because it wasn't there and library Y has this common functionality that lots of people use. Program B comes along and it also uses library Y, but it doesn't have to install it because it's already there thanks to program A. So these two programs, programs A and program B, reduce the amount of software that they had to install. They reduce the amount of software that they had to write simply by sharing a library of pre-written software that one of them had to install on your system. Now, things get interesting. What happens when you uninstall program A? Should it uninstall the library? Well, that'll break program B. Should it leave the library there? Well, if there's no program B, then it's leaving something behind that doesn't need to be there. Should it leave library B because another program is known to be using it? I wish. That's the problem. There's really no way to track reliably who is still using library Y. So the bottom line then is that when you install and then uninstall software, particularly when they use shared components, it's often the safest thing for them to do to leave those shared components behind. The net result is those shared components will accumulate on your machine. But wait, it gets more confusing. What happens if that library itself has multiple versions? For example, program A uses version 2.14 of library Y. 
version B uses version 2.12, an older version of library Y. Now, if version 2.14 is present because program A was installed, then when you install program B, what should it do? Should it assume 2.14 is good enough because it's a newer version of a library that it relies on? Should it assume that only 2.12 will do and install it alongside of 2.14 if that's even possible? Downgrade the library by replacing 2.14, which it doesn't know anything about, with 2.12, which it knows it needs. Well, that's going to break program A. Or the other scenario, if program B was installed first, what should program A do? Should it replace version 2.12 of the library with its newer 2.14, possibly breaking program B? Or should it install version 2.14 alongside of 2.12? if that's even possible. As you can see, there are many possibilities depending on what the capabilities of the library are and what the assumptions of the software are. Over time, most programs have taken what I'll call the safest approach, which is to say the approach that will break the fewest other programs. That means they'll generally have multiple versions of the same library installed on your machine. In our example, both 2.12 and 2.14 would show up on your machine if they actually could live side by side. You'll see that a lot with Visual C++ redistributables, which are architected to peacefully coexist with multiple different versions of the same library, simply because applications can't make the assumption that a version that they haven't tested against will actually work with their software. So one of the other things that, yes, it does kind of contribute to software rot, but not as much as people think, are updates. Well, of course, people love to rail against Windows Update as being a cause of various problems. Generally, if Windows Update is going to cause a problem, it's going to cause it quickly and severely, and you'll know it right away. By and large, Windows Update is actually very stable in the long run. Honestly, it's very stable in general. The reports of failures are overblown by the media, in my opinion. While they do exist, most people aren't impacted by Windows updates. Now, other applications also have different reputations for the quality of their updates. I get that. But by and large, updates are a safe thing to take. They're a highly recommended to, thing to take simply because in many cases, the security issues that they account for and that they then prevent are significantly more costly, if you will, than the risk of any uh, destabilization because of so-called software rot. Now, there is one scenario that does tend to accumulate over time, and it's definitely worth noting. As we've seen, as we've stated elsewhere, software kind of sort of only gets bigger over time. It kind of sort of only makes more demands on your systems over time. And the same is true for operating systems, for the applications you use, for whatever might be getting updated. It's very possible that each incremental update needs just a little bit more RAM, for example, than the previous one. You get enough of those over time and all of a sudden the incremental RAM requirement of the application that you happen to be updating achieves some kind of, I'll just call it critical mass, where all of a sudden your system that used to be good enough for running this particular piece of software is now kind of sort of pushing the limits. The software's incremental requirements have increased to the point where it actually is pushing your system to the edge. That's a form of software rot, although it's not necessarily technically destabilization. It does manifest as decreased performance because the requirements have simply grown past what your system is capable of providing. So how do you prevent software rot? Well, number one on the list, of course, is avoid installing and uninstalling software to test it out or for fun or because you're curious. If you can, to the degree that you can, install what you need, but keep it at that. Don't go doing a lot of uninstalls for trying things out. If you want to try things out, if you are someone who needs to perhaps try things out repeatedly, I recommend you use a couple of different techniques instead. 
One might be to take a full image backup of your system before the install, test your software, and if you decide you don't want it, instead of uninstalling it, restore the previous backup, restore that backup image you took. It's the same thing. In fact, you'll be guaranteed that what you have is exactly what your system was prior to the installation with no leftover cruft. Another approach is to basically just have a sacrificial machine. We'll talk about what you might end up doing to that sacrificial machine in just a moment. But for the most part, if you've got a machine where it doesn't really matter how it performs, if software raw just isn't an issue on that machine, Sure, give things a try there first as your test bed before you make a commitment to install it on your own machine. And finally, one approach that might be available to you is to use virtual machines. As you know, I use virtual machines extensively here to demonstrate things and to have versions of the operating system around that I don't necessarily use day to day. That also means that virtual machines are a great way to test to give things a try, to fire up a virtual machine, install that software, see how it works. And if it doesn't damage the virtual machine, you're in great shape. In a lot of ways, it's like having a test bed machine, a sacrificial machine without necessarily needing additional hardware. So you've done what you can to avoid software rot, but it's still there. How do you fix it? There are two, and I will say only two, ways to fix software rot. One, is to restore an image backup of your machine that had been taken at a time before the software rot really kicked in, before you really noticed whatever the ramifications of the rot happened to be. The other approach, reformat and reinstall. Start over. That's the only guaranteed way to make sure that the only thing left on your machine are those things that you explicitly install. You've erased the entire machine and you've reinstalled Windows from scratch. You've reinstalled only the applications you use from scratch and you've restored your data. Naturally, to do a backup first. This is also what you end up doing on your sacrificial machine or your virtual machines when they become too destable. It just becomes a little bit less painful or perhaps a little less costly to reformat and reinstall or start from scratch on a sacrificial machine than it does on your main machine. But those are the only two ways to really conquer software rot once it's accumulated on your machine. Restore to a backup prior to the rot becoming a problem or reformatting and reinstalling Windows from scratch. Things have improved in recent years. While we used to basically plan on reinstalling Windows from scratch every year or two, that's no longer the case. It's very possible for an average user who isn't trying a lot of things to basically never have to deal with the issue. But the issue does remain, albeit at a slower pace. So it's one of those things to be aware of and understand what you can do to avoid it and what it is it really means to try and fix it should it get too bad. Hope you found this helpful. For the article on which this video was originally based, including updates, comments, related links, and more, visit askleo.com slash 126177. I'm Leo Notenboom. This is askleo.com. Thanks for watching.